Hello, everybody. Welcome back once again to the Crew First Culture podcast. My name is Jeremy, and thank you, as always, for spending some time with us today. Today, another guest that I'm excited to have on, got on Mr. Mark Davidson. How you doing, Mark? Good, sir. How about yourself? Pretty good. Pretty good. So when I first heard of you, it was on the Weekly Scrap, and I bring up Weekly Scrap a lot because it seems like a lot of his guests just echo you know all the things that I enjoy and I like and and so I I don't know I, I guess we just have similar taste and, and leadership styles so mm-hmm. but uh really enjoyed what you guys were talking about and we'll get into a little bit of that later sure. but uh go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and and as much or little as you want and we'll just get into it yeah no uh, I appreciate uh, you have have me on and to me any opportunity to talk about uh, leadership in a fire service and, and what we need in our craft and our trade is, is a big deal because hopefully there's ripples in the pond from that. Hopefully at some point there's even one nugget that somebody buys into. They're like, okay, that's cool. I'm digging it. I'm going to, I'm going to give that a shot. So uh, really appreciate it. Really appreciate what you do. And a shout out to Corley also with the weekly scrap and just any, any of these voices that help get the word out there uh, is, is super important for, for our entire, uh, craft. So, uh, a little bit about myself, um, been on the job in Fairfax County for, uh, 20, over 25 years now, uh, volunteered in, uh, North Carolina, uh, Pennsylvania and Maryland in succession, uh, before that, um, Prior to that, I spent, uh, was fortunate enough to spend uh, eight and a half years dre- dressing like a tree uh, in, in the Marine Corps. And then uh, before that, I was pretty much a ju- juvenile delinquent. So there's not, not before that, it gets kind of gets kind of sketchy. But uh, all that said, I've um, been very fortunate with my time in Fairfax, where I've had a very, uh, very career, but I've always been at uh, our busiest houses. Uh, firefighter, uh, bucket firefighter, uh, engine driver, then truck driver, and then uh, truck OIC. And, and that was, uh, to me, really where I was able to cut my teeth and, and get my experience on the line and make a lot of mistakes and then learn from those mistakes. And uh, then I had an opportunity to teach with basic training, uh, which was very foundational for me. Just took what I already knew I loved to do, which was to teach. I started that process uh, while I was in the Marine Corps and then uh, really uh, hone it. I think that that four years was a big deal in, in my evolution as, a, as an instructor and teacher. And then uh, a little over four years ago, I got a phone call uh, because and essentially the, the phone call was uh, and I, I uh, are we allowed to use terms of art on this show? Is this a family friendly show? Oh yeah. No, yeah, no. Yeah. So if get, it comes out, it art. comes out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, 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 basically the, uh, the boss who had just taken over our training division said, Hey, uh, you seem to be bitching a lot about uh, officer training. Do you want to do something about it? <laughs> and, and of course I should have just said, no, nah, it's much, e- much easier to sit around the kitchen table and bitch about things and do something about it. So uh, no, it was an interesting it, 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 there's a longer story to that, but at the end of it, that phone call was the first domino in taking what had been an ad hoc group of us who were trying to, to really push this narrative about training for leadership um, and uh, informalize it. And then two and a half years ago, oh no, not quite two and a half, a little over two years ago, uh, after being at it for that couple of years, the section was formalized and now we're on this hopefully this unbreakable line going forward to to continue that for for our organization so that that's the reader's digest version i hate long walks on the beach the beach is a stupid thing to do i like a highly chlorinated swimming pool um other than that man i'll take a beach right now with with what i've been (laughs) staring the the weather we've had here lately is yeah that's fair and 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 a a quick shout out to everybody that's that's going texas i I know you guys were hit hard and just everybody that's that's going through this this craziness right now that you know take care of themselves and hope everything works out well definitely so fairfax what what state is that virginia fairfax county is 
uh, contiguous to DC, kind of to the west and along the south. So if you picture a little crescent gotcha. just right outside of uh, uh, DC. Okay. So you, I, I, if I'm thinking right, you in the, the uh, episode with Corley, you were talking about trying to get back on the line Mm -hmm. As far as is that, has that happened or are you still in training division? <laughs> still in the training division. Uh, it was funny. <laughs> we, we were, I was pushing a, a deal as much as you can. I was, I was voicing very <laughs> clearly that I needed <laughs> for my own sanity, if nothing else, I needed to get back out uh, at it in March. And that was, we were beginning to move to that. And then uh, unfortunately got some news here at the Davidson Estates that uh, is going to preclude that for a couple of months. My wife's going to need a significant surgery. So we're now looking at July, July. And uh, at the point where I'm, I start walking the hallways mumbling and there's a Robitussin <laughs> bottle, but clearly I don't have a cold. That's, that's, that's when we know that the Davidson's kind of broke with the, the yeah, go, going back change. to the beginning. <laughs> yeah, no, going back to the beginning, the phone call for years and change ago was was just, hey, do you want to come up here and let's see what we can do? There was no position, uh -huh. there was no portfolio, there was nothing. And four years later, uh, yeah. I'm like, okay, I got, you know, it's like the <laughs> WWE. You get beat with that folding chair enough, you got to tap out. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that's uh -huh. still uh, on the horizon, but uh, barring any, other significant news. Hopefully by July, I'll be back at it. I understand that we've our our training division is it's very formal. I mean, I I don't see anybody. Well, I say that we have had a few people kind of go over when things were getting rough and they needed help, and it was a it was an informal thing like that. But mm -hmm. uh, it seems like nowadays with with unions and everything else, that's that's kind of a strange deal to just kind of offer. You know what I mean? It, it's almost like it, it needs to be a position or we're not doing stuff like that. So, yeah, we're very fortunate. It fortunate, unfortunate. Virginia is 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 a, a state that does it has one of the lowest forms of collective bargaining and in, 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 uh, uh, in that union management relationship. But with that, uh, particularly Fairfax and, and those in the metro D.C. region, the unions have managed to carve out a pretty strong position. So that with, with respect to union stuff, that's that's the deal. As far as this idea of, of that, that's one of the advantages of not having a CBA is that that flexibility. There's there's good and bad to that. So, oh, yeah. you know, we, we could argue that all day long. But in this particular <laughs> case, the fact that the chief training officer made a conscious decision to say, look, get up here. And he talked with our ops boss, got me detailed out of ops. Uh, it, in, it speaks to something that I that I talk on regularly is that for any organization, these things are possible. The, the problem sometimes is the perception that, oh, it's Fairfax County, Virginia. And uh, Brunicini had a joke when he came out one year. He said, I can, I can tell by your apparatus that when you run out of gas, you just go buy new ones. <laughs> so which is the pot calling uh, yeah, at the time, the pot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Metal. Um, but you were very fortunate for the resources we have. But part of that battle is that perception that, well, in order to do officer development, in order to have a significant training function, you have to have deep pockets and this and that. And I can't say it enough. No, it doesn't. All the, all the work that we did to get to a foundation that got us this formalized position was all ground up, it was all just, hey, what can we do? So literally a pot yeah. of coffee and six people around the kitchen table. That, that's yeah. what started it. So if we can do that, to me, any organization can make that oh, same yeah. lift. You know, I think, I don't even, I don't even understand the mindset that, that is saying that it's going to cost a lot of money to do that. It, it's going to cost work. Yes. It's going to cost a lot of freaking work is what it's yes. going to cost. Oh, yes. And, and what, <laughs> I, it's weird to me that somebody would even think that. And, and if you are thinking it's going to cost some money. Yep you need to kind of adjust what your thought process is because it doesn't. Yeah. And, and where are you going to invest your money? You know, I, I get it. We got to get rigs on the road and, 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 and operations is, is the tip of the spear that that is obvious, but if you're cutting your training budget and we, we suffer through this, this is this, there's a, there's a whole timeline where for six years we didn't have what was called at the time an officer development school because of budget. That six years 
to me is still having an impact on organization because for six years there was effectively no officer training occurring. Now you have this entire cohort, this generation of officers who has moved beyond that first rank because an officer development school at the time for us was just for lieutenants, which whole other rant about that. Uh, at the end of it, that impact is still being felt because they moved up, they're captains now, they're battalion chiefs, they, they, they've moved on and there's been no other training up until we, we got things started. That, that's, that's negligent. And, and to have anybody just look at it and say, oh, we can't afford it. Ah, can you afford the outcomes? And, and that is just so clear. You know, any, everything is about training and that ability to impact somebody in their, the arc of their career to get them to do better, you can't miss those opportunities. Yeah, and uh, I, I guess where my mind is on that whole conversation is the the money situation. Okay, if, if you're talking about a, a department, and I don't care where it is, what it is, if you are low on money and you gotta be tight and all that, surely you have some good leaders there, surely. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if you do, then, they need to be the ones to just come up with it. I mean, I don't understand why we make these things so hard. Yeah. If, if you have no money or, or, or no, just whatever, whatever you're lacking, you got somebody that can do something and put something together. And if you don't have somebody you can trust to do that, that's a, that's a problem that needs to be dealt with first off right there. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, think about that. That If you say, well, nobody in my agency, in my organization, my company, my department has the, the skill to teach this next level. It's like, oh my God, you have way bigger issues. Either you <laughs> truly don't trust the people around you yes. and that you're the problem, or you've managed to uh, uh, create or be part of an organization that hasn't developed their people. And that's, yeah. that's not a good sign. But even yeah. with that, a lot of times, what, what's that classic saying in the fire service? You're never an expert except 60 miles outside of where you work. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, that, that doesn't that hold true? Well, shoot, go, go 60 oh, yeah. miles in any direction. Hey, hey, everybody thinks you're the bomb. Can you come over here and talk? Yeah. You know, I'll take you out yeah. to lunch. You know, I'll give you a strong cup of coffee, whatever it takes. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, the, the, you're, you're exactly on point. They can't, it can't be a rationalization. Um, to, to say we, we can't afford it or it's not within our purview. It just, it, yeah. we, we can't afford that. And, and I think the fire service has suffered for that for way too long because it's a problem that's truly uh, across our entire industry. Yeah. And it's, it's funny as, as you, <clears throat> excuse me, as you're sitting there saying that, I just had a, a goofy thing go through my mind. You know, you, you have these air quote book clubs that you, you know, the, the, you know, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. people read books together and talk about, okay, well, if we even want to go even more simple, there are so many great books, even if you just want to, to pin down firefighter or fire service leadership books, yes. there are a bunch of them. Yes. have a book club and, and talk about the, I mean, there's so many, and I'm sitting here thinking of this stuff, like right now, it's not like we're brainstorming in a shark, you know, uh, you know, a think tank about this stuff. So right. I just, as you could probably see, these these topics get me kind of irritated slash fired up pretty easily. Oh, I'm with you. Because there's no excuse for it. it, yeah. it there's, there's just no excuse. You can just leave it right there. And so yeah. I, I, and it's funny, you said that you had a six year period where you didn't have any officer development stuff and, and you can feel or at least see the uh, the complications that come from that. Yeah. You know, trying to be as careful as I can personally. We have never had any kind of offer to serve development stuff, so you can only imagine what that looks like. You know, and and that is a that's a bad deal. Yeah. You know, I've been on for almost nineteen years. I've been an officer for ten, and. I haven't ever really had anything like that, except for things I go and do on my own. And that sucks. It's just, it's, it sucks. Yeah. So self-development is a critical part of leadership development. There's no question. And investing in yourself uh, should always be the norm because then the other extreme is we have our brothers and sisters in, in these really tight CBAs or, or they are uh, in an environment and I'll just say it for what it is, 
where unless they get paid, they will literally say, I'm not going. Unless you're paying me time and a half, unless you're giving me the time, I'm not doing it. And so it, either extreme that, that exists, that idea that self-development is a critical part of it is true. But to leave it only to that means yeah. you're leaving it to chance. I, I, I use this phrase, leadership by accident. And, and that idea that maybe you have, have cracked the code and you've read the books and you've gone to the conferences and you've talked with the people and, and, and all that. Um, but what about the, 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 your members to the left or your right? And, and what did they get? And, and even the idea when I'll, I'll ask a group, what did, your, what did your organization teach you to make you an effective leader? Of course, the assumption is they're an effective leader. And uh, they'll say, oh, well, uh, I, I had this captain who I, when I got uh, out of recruit school, he mentored me and he taught me all these things or this chief or whatever. OK, so wait a minute. So what you're suggesting to me is that your department assigned you purposely to this captain so that you could be mentored. And there's a system in place so that all the other members go, well, no, no. I mean, that's just where I was assigned when I came out of recruit school. Well, that means it was completely by chance. That's, that's not how you win the battle. Just, you know, hope is not a plan. And that, that idea is so critical because that's where we're at. You're, the, we, this resource rich department that I'm in, that I'm very fortunate and happy, proud to be a part of, uh, we just weren't paying the bills. We, we weren't looking at that as a necessary part of doing business. And if we were doing that, then by extension, it becomes the problem magnifies. And we're just a representation of the whole American fire service. So to me, these conversations are hopefully beginning to prime the pump a little bit more. And, and you know, just any dialogue that, that gets somebody to go, yeah, why aren't we training our officers? You know, if we if we spend this much time training our new firefighters to be, you know, effective at throwing ground ladders and forcing doors and, and dragging hose line and starting IVs and all that other stuff, why are we not doing that for our new fire officers? Yeah. And that that analogy has to hold true. So yeah. I'm with you. Yeah, I, you know, we we discussed for a few minutes before we push for a push record kind of where my name came from as far as the the crew first culture and yeah, it, it ties into this because that's that's why I'm here right now. That is that is why I'm here because I wanted to do something at my department. I wanted and offered over and over again, man. If if you guys ever need me to to do something to create officer stuff, yeah, I want to help do something for the department to get us in that in that path and and it's just nothing just silence and it, it just kept building up frustration building up resentment i was very mad very angry and if i didn't find a good positive outlet very quickly i was going to be that guy that started doing stupid stuff sending angry emails and and completely undermining my whole message you know what i mean and yeah. And so that's what led me on this path, which I'm very thankful for. But it's still sad to me that that it took that that's why I'm here. You know what I mean? And and even worse is nothing has changed. You know, I, I'm trying to do my best away from work, doing these things, mm -hmm. but nothing has changed where I work, where I have devoted 19 years of my life, and that I hate it. Yeah. Well, I, I'll I'll give you this: the the journey that I was on to get to a point where we have this formalized section was a 12 year journey. And it, it, everything you're saying just is ringing so true because I just started, it, it started literally with a moment where I looked out at the, at the training ground when I first got assigned to basic and there was a group doing, um, a couple of our members uh, really bought into the uh, uh, Hose line advancement. Uh, oh my God, I'm such an idiot. Uh, <laughs> Seattle guy. Uh, nozzle forward. Nozzle forward. <laughs> I, I apologize. It's early in the morning. I'm so sorry. Right. Nozzle forward. So a group of them really bought onto it and they brought the nozzle forward and they became instructors and they're just so motivated. And I'm looking out at this group of firefighters. In, it was a hot day. They're dragging line. They're just totally into it. And I said to myself, why do we not have this for officers? Why does this not same concept exist where we bring in somebody, have this discussion and get that same vibe going. Cause I know we have 
highly motivated officers who want to do better. And that started the very first move towards towards this whole thing. But it was it was born out of frustration. And it, it took a long time and a lot of beating my head against the wall. I got a lot of that's cute, Davidson. Is that going to cost us any money? Because <laughs> and there were other voices at the state level in the background, like, ah, you guys don't want to do that. That's uh, we got it. We, we, we got your back. And um, it it's it what you're doing is important it, is finding that outlet and saying, hey, how do I still spread this message? And it, it'll come. That's that's all you can keep on doing is keep working the problem. And at some point it will come. And it's not always the uh, as quick as we would like, but uh, you know, it, it, it happens. It just takes a long path sometimes. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think even, even more of a complication for us is it's, it's the retirements have slowed down here in the past couple of years for sure, but, mm -hmm. but we went through a five, probably a five, maybe even up to almost 10 year stretch where we lost a lot of people, you know, retirement wise. Mm -hmm. And which means Right now, we have a lot of very young officers, you know, and not, I, I will say not myself included, not necessarily age wise, but mm -hmm. just in the job. Sure. And, but both ways, we've got some very young age wise officers too. And, you know, these are great people. And, and I know they have a lot of potential, but they need help. I, we need help. Yeah. You can't, you cannot be a good fire service officer without some external help. I, I'll just say that right now. There is no, there's no way. And yeah, no, so training, training yeah, and education, go ahead. everything. Yeah. It's, it's just such a struggle. And, you know, the, and what I think another kind of area of frustration is what we do focus on when there is something it's, Oh, it's the tactical stuff or the decision making, you know, things like that, <laughs> which is like 2% of my job, you know, at the most, maybe not even that it's like, Tell me how to deal with seven different people and all their personalities and how to get them all motivated. And yeah, tell me that because I don't know how to do that. That's hard. That's when it's that's when it's not as fun to be an officer. You know what I mean? Yeah. One of my favorite quotes from a highly dysfunctional officer was, uh, you know, this job would be great if it wasn't for the people. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> I couldn't even help myself. Hey, Dolt, that is the job. People is the job. What, what would you even think? Why would that even come out of your mouth? I mean, that's the <laughs> stupidest statement you could possibly make. And generally speaking, I try and be positive. And I, that, that was just one of those moments where you can't be positive. You, you have completely uh, missed the point. This job is about the people. And, yeah. and exactly what you said, if we only train for the tactical side of the equation, we're going to fail. Because yeah. to be effective tactically, you have to build a base yes. beforehand. And that, that fire ground, Absolutely. the rationalization, quote unquote, but he, he, but he or she is good on the fire ground. What that says to me really clearly is they suck at everything else. And you hear that constantly. Oh, but, they, oh, but they're good on the fire ground. Yeah, but that's a 1% problem. I mean, even in job town, wherever that is, they're not <laughs> fighting fire, they, you know, and they're in the firehouse. And if they're not building the seeds for success, if they don't understand crew dynamics, conflict management, uh, all those other elements, good, effective, small unit leadership, if they don't understand those components, they can't possibly have success on the fire ground because there's no light switch for this. <clears throat> it, it'll display at some point, it'll display itself. So yeah, it, it, it's so critical. And without the training and education piece, how the, the equivalent, again, going back to the new firefighter, the, the equivalent would be if we just said, tell you what, we're just going to hire 25 people off the street. And once we do the background check, uh, we're going to assign them to a firehouse and that's it. OJT you know how much money you would save in your training division and your organization just you you would blank out all that time and effort because it that's a lot cheaper well we know the results would be catastrophic but for a new fire officer that's exactly what we do we we hired you you took a test you have the basic capability we're pretty sure you're not a serial killer um go to work go go figure it out 
And that model is insane. Uh, uh, I, I always talk about the, the idea that if the US military trained for leadership the way the American fire service does, we would be like the French and get our asses kicked all day long. We just would, because there's, if you maybe train a little bit at that first entry level rank for officer and, and most, that's, that's a lot. For the American fire service, that's a big hurdle. Most don't do it at all, but let's say they do a little bit. After that though, or the captain, a battalion chief, deputy chief, assistant chief successively, what do you train? Nothing. And if you have a general of the army who's still leading like he's leading a platoon, they're going to fail. And, and conversely, if you have a platoon leader who's leading like he's the general of the army, they're going to fail. But you, you have to train and educate for that at each level successively, constantly. It, it's an effort. And that's part of the problem. Once they start to see the scope of it, I think some of them get scared. They, they think, oh, I've got, I can't eat that elephant. It's just too much. Well, you eat the elephant one bite at a time. Yeah, start somewhere. Yeah. And just those little injects. And that's that's where we started. Just little little injects to start the process. And now it's 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 snowballed into something hopefully that that sustains itself. Yeah. That's fine. You you bring up the whole the military thing. And you know, I, I don't have any military background, so this probably would even be more of an irritation to me, but another it feels like you're you're hitting on all my irritations here today but <laughs> another another thing that gets hey, on me is my wife ends up listening to this she she, she understands that's what I do <laughs> all day long but it, it irritates me that we lean so heavily on this paramilitary organization mm -hmm. because <clears throat> to me the only military thing about the fire service is that we call our positions you know, captain and sergeant and, and those things outside of that like you just said it's like we don't really do anything associated with the military we got we got a little bit of a rank structure okay you can't really come on now I mean, everything yeah. else just falls apart yeah and and to, and to be clear what what you'll never hear me say is oh the mil we got to do things like the military the one oh yeah i know the one thing i do absolutely steal from the military, which I think is critical, is, is the template, is the model for training for leadership, because they get that absolutely right. The idea, though, is to take that model and translate it into what works for us, the relevancy piece. And exactly what you're talking about is so critical, because some of the legacy of that hierarchical structure, of that para paramilitary bit, you know, first of all, you know, we, it, we have a lot of our members who love to talk about the military and the, the, the best expression that I can apply to this and it complete, it definitely not my own is everybody loves to talk military shit until they got to do military shit. <laughs> so if we had a quote unquote Paris Island, if we had a officer candidate school like in Quantico, if we had, you know, you will do this, our members would buckle under in oh, a God. second. They, they say no they like it. But to truly say, well, then you got to do these things. Oh, wait a minute. No. <clears throat> oh, yeah. So, and I'm not suggesting that that's what we need to do, but I'm saying take the elements that work and just this yeah. basic framework for training and education is, a, is where we start. Um, but to take the other elements of that where, you know, I'm, you know, and again, they, uh, you watch Full Metal Jacket. Oh, Gunny Hartman. I, you know, you will not laugh. You will not cry. You don't <laughs> want that leader. In the firehouse, no. are you kidding? No, no. You would yeah. never want that. Yeah. And so the idea is to understand what our environment is, apply what works, and those parts of that hierarchical, I'm in charge, I make a decision, only I will, I, I only trust me, and all decisions come from me. That's fundamentally flawed in our world. And even, yeah. and this is the key point, what the people who don't, uh, understand the military uh, well do is they look at that movie they look at it they it's almost a cartoonish figure of what the military represents but they look at that and said that's what the military is somebody who yells yelling as a leadership skill and uh and they're they make decisions go get them but what they don't see in the background for the effective military leaders is that they are listening they do take input from their crews from their teams and and that's yeah. what makes them effective, incredible, and respected. 
uh, when they need to make a decision, they make one. But in the background of all that is that the fundamentals of what we all view as and know as good leadership. And, and that's the part that needs to be translated uh, because without that, they just take it at face value. Oh, I just got to yell a lot and act like I know what I'm doing. And just no matter what anybody says, you know, charge the hill. Nah, that's not how it works. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, for me, like I said, I, I don't have a military background, was not in the military. I, I don't even, I don't have a lot of interest in military stuff like Vietnam movies. You know, the, the guys at the station give me a hard time because I just don't, I don't dig it. I just can't yeah. get into it. Yeah. But, uh, or history or anything like that. I've never had much interest in that, but I've started listening to Jocko podcast mm -hmm. and you know, that's, a majority of what he talks about, but he twists it into leadership stuff. And that is really, I feel like the more I listen to it, the more I just want to listen to more because it just, it's almost like it's the leadership stuff I need and want to hear, but he adds in military stuff to it that I don't really know anything about. So it's almost like it, those two things compound that learning experience for me. Oh, you just hit on something so crucial. The, the, the whole issue is what I call a small dog, petite canine conversation, because it, not everybody has to be dialed into, oh, the military is awesome. And I love yeah. Band of Brothers. And for me, that's my wheelhouse. I'm comfortable with that. Yeah. But for somebody else to hear that and go, ah, eh, but maybe uh, Simon Sinek, you know, Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, you know, some other voice, uh, a voice in, in education, uh, a Jocko, maybe, you know, me personally, one of the things uh, I'm going to get myself in trouble. One of the things about Jocko, the, the message is solid and it's a great message, but it's it's literally if you translate that to uh, Simon Sinek or Brene Brown or anybody else, it's the same thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But what's important is how it resonates. Yep. And so if for you, that resonates great. If it doesn't, maybe it's Simon Sinek, maybe it's Brene Brown, maybe it's Malcolm Gladwell, whoever it may be, it doesn't matter as long <clears> as you're listening. And one of the things that I, and I, we talked about this shortly before we started, that I, that I absolutely invest in is that idea of making a small jump. Because for our members, when they hear something that doesn't ring true, they'll discount it in a second. They'll just be like, ah, that doesn't make any sense. That's not me. That's not a bad thing. That's true. That's just who our target audience is. We build and design them to make these snap judgments very quickly under strenuous conditions, time compressed with high, highly risky outcomes. So they're designed to do that. That's fine. But to get to a point where they can listen to a message on why empathy is a good thing, why the ability to manage conflict is a good thing as a leader, why uh, demonstrating vulnerability is not a bad thing. Sometimes they get right away, oh, that's Dr. Phil, and that's huggy stuff, and that's not what this job is about. And bottom. Okay, fine. I don't want to build that wall. So by having a Jocko, by having uh, a clip from Band of Brothers, uh, open up the possibility of the thought. When you hear when you hear Buck Compton and Band of Brothers speak specifically about a leader's heart, it's hard for, for some 25-year-old firefighter to go, ah, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah. Are you kidding me? This is, a, <laughs> this is somebody from the greatest generation who suffered through things you can't even imagine. And he says something that is so fundamental about a leader's heart and understanding his people. If he can say that, you have no reason not to. And, yeah. and so when they, that's a much shorter leap. Once you get them over that wall, oh my God, the possibilities are endless. They, then they're like, okay. And, and we've seen that. We've been very fortunate to have some of our members who were very obstinate at first when we started talking about conflict management and, and teaching that skill. Uh, but then subsequently they would come back and say, man, I, I was in a situation and, and this thing happened and, I, and it worked. It actually worked. And that's a big deal. That's a big deal. So I, I think your experience is, is so crucial in, in understanding what's effective. It doesn't always have to be about, you know, the military. It doesn't, it, it's, it's, in fact, if you're doing it well, you're hitting from a whole bunch of different perspectives. 
it's it's important that any one of those clicks in and that's yeah. that's the battle that's the battle yeah. you you talked about the Jocko and, and Sinek and, and all these people are basically saying the same things. They're, they're saying them differently. They're, yep. they're using different contexts and, context and, and all that. And that's always been a very interesting kind of conversation topic, whatever you want to call it, to me. And it's also a baseline of something that I feel very strong about is put out your message. Share your message. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you come from. You have a message mm -hmm. and somebody needs to hear it, you know, and, and it's so interesting that you can have somebody like a Maxwell that has literally reached millions and millions of people, but there are a lot of people out there that don't care for it. Right. And, and maybe a Jocko, a, you know, maybe that's the kind of people those people lean to. Yeah. But then there's some people that. You know, a Mark Davidson, a Jeremy Sanders, a Bill Thomas from who knows where, that's who they need to hear. And, and it's so, it just, it just means so much to me that there are people out there that need to hear your message, step up and start sharing it. Yeah. Now you're, and, and what you hit on is just that diversity of voices. And even, even that word in our industry gets people twitchy. They're like, oh, diversity, oh, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you know, but that's what it is. You know, I have a whole conversation of iron versus steel and, and you know, which one is a, which one is stronger. And yeah. that fundamentally speaks to the idea because I, there are plenty of people who think I'm absolutely full of shit. There's just a laundry list of them. I get it. Hey, I think I'm full of shit most days. But to have somebody else to listen to you, to listen to somebody else and go, what he said or what she said clicks. I, I dig that. I, I strong, that's, that's what we're after. If, if anything, it's almost, I would say the upside of COVID, just the explosion of content and, and, and these discussions. Um, to me, this has been, I hope, and I hope it lasts, uh, you know, the, it continues going forward, has been just these conversations are happening at a much more rapid pace. And that, that message in all levels is, is getting out there. And, and there's, there's very few people who can, can honestly go, oh, I didn't know. No, nobody told me that effective leadership was important. Eh, eh. You know, if you're Ted Kaczynski in your cabin out in the woods, maybe. <laughs> but, but other than that, uh, you know, I think we're, we're starting to really see people value that discussion and, and to have all these voices, you, Corley, you know, just saying, hey, this is what we need um, is, is good stuff. It's really good stuff. I think I think that's a really interesting kind of idea that you threw out there. And as you're talking, I'm kind of throwing it around in my head, you know, so pre-COVID, you, you obviously have a, a lot of fired up people in the fire service still. But these people that are fired up for the fire service back then are going to conferences and they're they're kind of concentrating themselves in these areas. Now you take that away. So these people that are usually sharing that power, that passion and all that in those concentrated areas are now being dispersed and and we're flooding the social media and, and flooding the podcast area and I feel like maybe back then before COVID, the, the social media stuff was so negative and people were jumping on. I honestly feel like I don't see much of that anymore. Maybe that's just because I don't involve myself in anybody that, that does that. Sure. But back when I first started and that was right around, you know, the kind of maybe a month or two before all that hit, it was anytime I put something out, a video or something, I was getting hammered. But I can't even tell you the last time I had a negative comment on, on any of my stuff. And I feel like it's like a light bulb moment when you said that. It's like maybe that's why, because all these passionate, fired up people are like me having to find other ways to get this out. And so we have flooded you know, all these other avenues. That's it. It's really interesting. Yeah. It, and I think it's a function not only of now there's so much more before there was very few places. So that, that troll in the basement uh, who's sitting there like, Oh, I, I'm going to, I'll show them. They don't know what they're talking about because clearly it shows this and whatever that crap is. Um, first of all, now it's not a few targets, it's thousands of targets. So that already starts to dilute their, their ability to make an impact. 
And what we're finally seeing is stronger voices step up and say, dude, shut the fuck up. Yeah. Nobody wants to hear your shit. And so they start getting pounded on. And, and now that plurality of voices is finally starting to raise the conversation. One of the things on, 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 on the group that I have is that it's not even, a, I don't even engage in a two-way conversation. I just don't. You know, this is a yeah. one-way forum just to get some information out there, do with it what you will, but we're not here to discuss other than in a positive way. And even if you don't agree, that's fine, but it has yeah. to be in a positive fashion. It has to be something constructive. Um, yeah, I, I do believe that in, in that other point you hit on where, you know, it was, it was focused on conferences and there's, I love conferences just to, to, to talk with people and network and go grab a beer afterwards no question but if you think about the fact that there are ostensibly 1.1 1.2 fire a million firefighters in north america how many people can you crowd into indy or nashville now columbus or any one of these places hey, yeah. you're, you're getting such a small percentage now ripples in a pond they go back and and spread that word but that impact is nowhere near as much as it's been now. And, and even the, the large conferences have been forced to, to, to say, hey, let's broadcast this material out there, uh, all these webinars. And, and the, the, the craft conferences is, a, is a, a phrase I've thrown at it um, that are coming up. You know, those are so vital. Just these much smaller groups, these leaders who are saying, hey, look, we can't afford to go to Indy. We can't afford to go to Columbus. You know, we got to do something here in our backyard. And yeah, we've got SMEs right where we're at. Let's put on some coffee, put out some flyers and get some people to come together. And it's been some really, really good stuff. Virginia has been very fortunate for that because uh, Fireground Commander, Andy Frederick's Training Day and the 350 line folks, you know, they, they're concentrated between uh, Richmond and, and, and DC or a narrow path along on 85. We're incredibly fortunate. And then the state has a conference. so that, that idea of building those up, not, I'm not saying it replaces them, but augmenting that with yeah. all this material and all this, all this good positive stuff is a big deal for us, I think. And, and hopefully we don't go back from it. Yeah, that, man, that's, it's, I said it before, it's very interesting kind of since you said that, how it kind of clicks and all that makes sense. And yeah, you know, I agree. I hope that once everything starts opening up more and it already has, you know, there's already, you know, there's, big time conference going on right now in Florida mm -hmm. that hopefully we kind of keep some of that middle ground, you know, keeping, like you said, there's a very small percentage of, of people going to these conferences and, and yes, you know, the, the few that go and come back, there is some ripple effects, but, you know, depending on what they're going back to, they could be going back to toxic environments that completely snuff out whatever they're bringing back. And it's absolutely worthless. And so you, you can't, we're, we're going to have to find other ways to, to keep this going besides that. So I, I completely agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, <clears throat> that idea, and this gets, goes to, to, to crew, your crew first culture. I think that cult, culture kills policy, culture kills ideas, culture will kill a lot of incipient uh, uh, thinking. And that's unfortunate and it's hard. And for somebody who is coming back from that environment of learning or just seeing something different and saying, hey, I got this great idea. Ah, this is the way we've always done it. Or that's a stupid idea. Bad, it won't work. And well, I mean, maybe it won't work, but at least consider it. That, that's all that takes is even that consideration because at the point where you have a member come back with this idea or, or somebody uh, say, hey, I'm, I'm willing to try this, at least consider it. And if nothing else, you leave the, the possibility open, the door open for that future uh, uh, next idea to come in. But when you just slam the door, you know, before you even say hello, just slam the door shut, that's yeah. ineffective. That's ineffective. Yeah. And, and that, that is unfortunate that uh, it happens, but then we can talk about uh, perseverance and resiliency because that member has to keep at it. it it's, uh, we do uh, live in a conflict avoidant world and we do have folks that when they hear no, they're just like fainting goats and fall over and well, I tried. No, you gotta keep on trying. 
you, you got to get back in there. And, and sometimes that may not make you the most popular. That may not make it, uh, you know, you may be banging your head against the wall, but you've got to keep at it because if you know you've got the, the, the solution to a problem or a potential solution to a problem, just to hear no once and say, uh, I tried, I gave it a shot. They didn't listen. That's, that's not effective either. So it takes, it takes both sides of that equation to, to push forward. Yeah. It's, it's funny that, you know, I got a chance to go visit a, uh, fire station just south of where I live a hundred miles away from where I work. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the areas around where I live are, are a long way from the departments I work, uh, work with mm -hmm. at, or at the, the department, but I got invited to go to the one, to a fire station just south of where I live a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, it was, it was a cool experience just getting, getting to a, a firehouse that I haven't really gotten a chance to go anywhere like that. But, uh, mm -hmm. he was, just walking around showing me everything and showing me their their pre-connects and it, it's just a it's a very interesting concept that they're working with I'll just say that mm -hmm. and he was talking to me about his struggles with it and and trying to get some change done and just kind of hitting some walls and so uh so I next shift I was on you know I kind of started messing with maybe some other options with it you know, this had nothing like 0% of anything that I was going to do for our department. You know, there's, mm -hmm. there's no piece of my mind thinking that I'm going to change anything we were doing. I was just trying to find a solution for somebody else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and we sat there and a couple of, of my, uh, my guys came out and wanted to play along. So we messed with it for a while. It was, it was like 34 degrees outside. It's freaking cold. And they, they said, hey, when we load it up on our prop and we'll just pull it a few times, see how it works. So, you know, what I'm saying and I'm trying to tie it into what you're saying is that, that had nothing to do with us as procedures and all that. Right. But we still got training out of it. We still got good stuff out of it. We learned and we did something and and it was helpful. And like you said, oh, okay, maybe it doesn't fit what we're doing or 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 fit our department. Yeah. But I guarantee you there's something you can learn from it. You know what, maybe a piece that you can pull from it or maybe a way that you can do what you are doing better is something. Yeah. If something and, is better than nothing and just shutting it down. Exactly. And, and, and the ripples in the pond for you, for your guys is now they've thought outside the box. They, they are open now to a new possibility, which they probably never considered before. The fact that you had a crew willing to go out in 34 degrees minus the snivel and just get the job done is, is a, that's a big deal. And, and uh, uh, that, that, and that's why I said before, I, I really dig that crew first name, that turn of a phrase, because that's servant leadership. That's you saying, Hey, I'm, I'm going to go out and do this. This isn't about me. This isn't my betterment. I just think this is an idea that's interesting. And the fact that you are, uh, empowering your crew to come out there with you because they know, Hey, he's out there. I'm out there. I'll give it a shot. That that's a big deal. And, and it goes to what we talked about before about that small hurdle, because if you tell a group of hard, rough and tough firefighter dudes and dudettes servant leadership, I'm not serving anybody. That's, that's the, I'm not a servant. Well, you, you turn that phrase and you say, well, crew first. Oh yeah. 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 I'm first. They, they, uh, you know, that idea helps get over that hurdle and gets them into acceptance. And once they accept and understand that, that's going to carry forward for a long, a much longer time than we're around. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, the, the whole crew first thing. And, and we talked a little bit about it before, but, uh, you know, I expressed a little concern to a friend of mine, not long after creating it, that, you know, I don't want it to be perceived as, oh, well, we have this them first movement going on right now. And, and this guy is totally against that. He's, he's saying that we're first. Well, no, that's, that's not, that is not even close to what I am about. Mm -hmm. I am about taking care of my people as a leader, because I know if I take care of them and I know if they respect me mm -hmm. and, and trust me that we are going to put them in the best possible situation that they can be put in, if that kind of makes sense. No, absolutely. My, my tagline, the MFPF, 
is is a turn of a phrase uh, uh, mission first people first uh, it's a, the the army had it as mission first people always and there's different variations of that you hear um, to me they're co-equal they are absolutely yin and yang intertwined you can't have one without the other because the people first part comes in two categories two flavors uh, the people being your crew, your team, the people who are going to get the job done. You can't possibly accomplish the mission without them. It's just, it just yeah. doesn't work. There's, I don't know anybody that, that is that good where they're going to drive the rig to the scene, hit the water supply, deploy the hand line, charge the line, advance the line, put out the fire over. It, come on. It, it, it yeah. doesn't happen. The other side of that, that people is, is the people we serve. They're first. They, they, at times they will come above, uh, above us in that hierarchy, but you can't, there's, it's grading shades of gray. You can't say, Oh, it's always the citizen. It absolutely is. But if I can't push a tenable position, I'm not going to throw my people inside of there to no end. And conversely, if my crew is exhausted and I need to give them 20 minutes to get something to eat, and then there's a public service call that I can dish off to a company that's nearby. Absolutely. Because unless my people are fed and ready to hit the street, they can't accomplish. The mission. So it's this whole, it's never one strictly above the other. They absolutely exist on equal plane. And that's the leader's art. That's why it's, there's no science to this. Uh, it's always about the art because it just depends. There's no cookie cutter approach to how you uh, invoke that or how you lead. Um, and, and that's the difficult part because it isn't just do step one, do step two, do step three, and you'll be really, really good. Yeah, yeah that's for sure. Yeah, something I want to touch on, I want to make sure that we hit on before you know, we uh, before we end this because yeah, yeah. It, it was the, the main kind of topic I wanted to bring up and we just kind of keep going on other things that are interesting. So I didn't want to, yeah. to break away, but you, yeah. you mentioned sniveling earlier, just a few minutes ago. And that's, that's a big, you know, I was just kind of cruising through your, your group a little bit before we started. And I saw that, you know, you, you reposted uh, the Von Oppen quote. And, yeah. That was brilliant. And, and talked about that. That, and, stuff. <laughs> that that's another big thing to me is, you know, people that, that gripe and, and don't have any solutions to it. It's, it's just griping. And that is just starting to irritate me more and more and more. And I have gripes. I, I, I'm sitting here telling you about some of my gripes as well. You know, mm -hmm. so I'm not saying having gripes is the problem, but you got to have some type of, and, and, and it goes right back to you, how you started this whole conversation is that phone call, mm -hmm. you know, somebody called you out and, and, and basically you, you stepped up. Okay. That's, that's the difference. So talk to me about that kind of your thinking on that post and, and what you said to it and, and just kind of go into that for a little bit. Yeah. His, his posts are, I, I like, cause they're so clean and, and, and simple, but very impactful. And I dig that. Um, yeah. So, you know, it was just a few key words that he said, and it just spoke to something that we know exists in, in any industry, but in the fire service in particular, because we have a kitchen table at the firehouse where all that just, that, that just, that's the stew. That's where we allow that, that stew to, to simmer. And um, it, it's critical because the problem we're faced with, and, and there's a whole discussion about who has the most impact in the fire service. And, and my strong feeling, and I talk on this a lot, is that it is the company officer. It, the company officers where the, the, the strategic level leader can issue policy all day long, you know, don't suck, be good. But whatever that translates to by the time it gets to the company officer, the shift leader, the, that voice in the firehouse, that's where it all lives or dies. And so when you have that environment where there, this one leader just complains all day long, the agency sucks, the citizens suck, the calls suck, this job would be great if it wasn't for the people, crap like that. And then now you're the, you're the troop, you're, you're the subordinate in that environment, you've got nowhere to go. You, you, you're, you're trapped in that firehouse for whatever the period of time is, is this person, it could be sunny rainbows 
yingling waterfalls and, and puppy kisses outside. But to hear it, it's the most awful place in the world. Yeah. And, and that goes to that line about people don't leave jobs, they leave bosses. And almost without exception, I have, a, I have the ability in my organization to look at our transfer request list. Okay. Well, first of all, when people leave the organization, it's not generally speaking because of the pay, the benefits, the, the bigger picture. It's because where they were assigned in, in that dysfunctional environment they were in. Within the agency, transfer request lists, I'll look at those. And I've actually done, I would call them lab experiments, where I see six or seven people at a two-piece house, basically the entire shift with transfer requests in. And I'll investigate, make some phone calls, find out what's going on. And, and it's a clear indicator of dysfunctional leadership. Subsequently, maybe the tra maybe a transfer occurred and that leader was moved out. New one within two weeks, all the transfer requests are pulled. Yeah. That that's what that speaks to. And, and that inability for that company officer to understand, instead of complaining to the people who have the least amount of influence in the entire organization, a, 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 a six-month proby firefighter listening to you complain about the problems in the agency and what we should be doing and what we could be doing and this and that, that's a bullshit cowardice expression right there. Because that proby has nothing to do but go, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. You know, if you really have uh, some intestinal fortitude, go complain to the bosses. Go complain to the people who can actually change the thing you're, you're complaining about, bring a solution, and then get ready to go to work. Because if you're not going to do that, do us all a favor, shut the fuck up because now my ears are bleeding and it just makes for a miserable work day. And that's the, the part that's difficult to get across. And, and we're, you know, when you talk about changing culture, getting leaders to understand that, it does you no good. Yeah. And uh, uh, Von Appen uh, uh, answered back uh, on, on the one thread and he said, gripes go up. That's a direct quote out of Saving Private Ryan. And I actually use that clip when I teach where uh, if you've seen the movie, he basically explains to his troops, hey, look, I don't complain to you, I complain up. That's, it, it, it's, it's a little more than that. There's a little bit of sarcasm built into it. But yeah. at the end of the day, that's the idea, is to get our leaders to understand if you're gonna bitch about something, bitch to the people who can actually change it and, and save the rest of us and then do something about it. Because then when your troops see that, they model that behavior. They're less likely to just snivel about something because they're like, hey, the boss is about rolling his sleeves up and making shit happen. If I'm gonna complain about something that I can influence, then I'm gonna come to him or her with a solution. And guess what? That's what we all want. Because you, even, and that's the problem, and I'll stop on the train here in a second. That's <laughs> also the problem, is their failure to recognize that they don't like it when the troops come to them and complain but they fail to recognize, well, you're doing the same thing. You're, you're, you're influencing that behavior. They're modeling what you're doing. Yeah. And in the process, you're making what should be just an awesome day. Any day at the firehouse is an awesome day. Yeah. And I can tell you any day at the firehouse is better than a, a day at the office. <laughs> I can tell you that from experience. But, and I can't, I can't. Um, at the end of the day, that that's important, just even that connection. And so we, we've got to build out of that, that cultural piece where we have leaders that think, oh, that's just what you're supposed to do. It's a firehouse. We have a kitchen table. We're supposed to get to the kitchen table and snivel about whatever's bothering us. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm with you. And it doesn't have to be like, oh, every, you know, my favorite superhero, Emmett. It doesn't have to be everything is awesome. That's <laughs> false also. But understand that what you're complaining about has to be something that's relevant, that, that truly is not going to deteriorate your team dynamic, because that's, you know, that's what you're building for. If you're a leader, that's your whole goal is to have an effective team. So, yeah. Anyways, that's my rant. No, I, and, and this is something I've said a couple of times, and I feel like I'm, I need to say it every time I, I get a chance, because it's, it's my version of my mistakes, hopefully sharing with others so that they don't make them but that a little bit of what you're talking about that's I fell into that a couple of years ago you know I was I was a very new officer I had built up what I felt like were good teams a couple of times and I had pieces taken away for reasons that I just that weren't really making sense to me and I was I was mad mm -hmm. I, it made me angry 
And so, you know, I was doing a lot of complaining to my people. I, I, I will say this, though, I was also complaining above. It wasn't me just being a coward and sticking it down there. Mm-hmm. I was complaining above, too, and it was going nowhere. Mm-hmm. But it was very wrong of me to do that. And, and how I justified it in my head is, well, these, these people are the people that I am closest to. This is my air quotes second family. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I I just need to be honest with them and, and I don't want to keep things from them and, you know, all, all all these justifications, Sure, but it led to exactly what you were talking about. It led to, this is who we are. We gripe about everything and, and we are angry at admin and, and that's who I created. Yeah. And so ever since I kind of woke up and figured out, well, that's not okay. Yeah. I have had to fight that. And I am still fighting the ripple effects, as you keep saying, yeah. of that. And that's just part of, you know, I I did it. So, you know, I'm not, I got nobody to gripe at about it, but myself, you know what I mean? And so I try to share that with as many people as I can, because, you know, don't do that to yourself. It, it, it's not where you want to be right. and it's not a road you want to have to fight back from. So just, just don't do it, but you know, no, it's, good, it's good easy stuff. to do. Yeah, no, good stuff. And I, 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 I like to talk on what I call the, sh- the shallow glide path into leadership versus a, a controlled flight into terrain. And that's a, a longer discussion, but exactly what you said is you, you want to set those bricks up so that when you make that move and, and you have that moment, it's not a jarring hard or right or left turn into that leadership moment. And but what you're saying is so critical, so important. And I hope a lot of people latch on to that, which is that idea that, you know, you you can build out of it. You can have that recognition. You've done what a lot of leaders can't uh, and won't do, which is self-assess and say, hey, what what do I got to do different? What, what am I creating? My top 10 list of screw ups is epic. Oh my God, spectacular. <laughs> and that's, that's the battle is to go, yeah, I, I totally botched that. Um, you know, that's the, let me not do it a second time and let me figure out how I can build out of this wreckage. And do I got to apologize to somebody? Do I got to train harder? Do I got to learn more? What is it I got to do to build out of this to make this uh, better for the future? Because unfortunately, I, I left the Hindenburg in the back in the rear view mirror. So I've got to, I got to do what I can. And, and that's a, that's an important part of leadership is, is to have that recognition and, and be able to say, yep, I'm going to move forward. I'm going to do better. And, and I'm, I'm going to try and show that next group. I mean, literally why else would we be doing this? This isn't, this isn't about us. This is about hopefully somebody latches on to it. And then this pays off dividends going forward. And that's the every day in the classroom or, or, or out teaching. That's, that's the whole gig. It's just a hope there are those ripples in the pond that, that affect change and make things better uh, across the board. Yeah. And that, you know, going back to, to what brought us here, it, that hinges mainly on people that want to do something, people that want to take action, doing something for the good instead of just griping or, or be, even just, you know, and it's not even just the griping, the, the physical act of getting it out. You know, there's a lot of people out there that don't gripe, but they're they're not happy with the, the way things are. They just keep it inside. Mm-hmm. And I don't you know, that's not much better. You, you sure. If you're not happy with something, if you see something that needs to be fixed, you know, the whole see a need, fill a need. Mm-hmm. You know, that's what's going to change things. That's what's going to turn things around. It's doing the work, getting out, making the changes that need to be done. Yeah. Frank, Frank Buscoso, when I saw him years ago, said a phrase which I should have known already in my life because I, I, you know, I've been in that environment. And, and he said, you, you know, don't walk past a problem that you can fix. Yep. The way he said it at the time just was it, like smacked me in the head. Like, yeah, of course. Why, why would you? Why would a leader do that? And, and I should have known better. I was in a point in my career also where I was like, ah, you know, I wasn't I, a part of what got me on the path I'm on was I dealt with a highly dysfunctional fire service leader. And, and I, I was at a point where I was going to lead the organization. And I said, ah, this isn't for me and, and all that other stuff. 
but fundamentally, uh, that that is the phrase that that struck with me. Okay. Yeah, no, my, <laughs> I think that right there, that is that is such a huge. That's almost like something. It's. I'm trying to think of a good way to to say this and and mean it as important as it is for me. It's almost like I have a a Ten Commandments of things you know that are in stone that everybody should just live by and that's that's something that should be on that you know and it it's a lesson that i try to teach my kids all the time it's a lesson that we have talked about at the fire station you know i don't care if you made the mess if you see it just pick it up it's just mm -hmm. the right thing to do it you know, and that goes like i said it goes at home mm -hmm. it goes at the firehouse when we see you know boxes over in the corner that somebody else left Right, right. You know, we can sit here and gripe for 30 minutes about it, or we can just take two minutes, go take them out of the trash and be done with it. Right. And, and so, yeah, that's, that's a huge, huge deal that, yeah. that goes from A to Z all the way through life for sure. And that one piece that you mentioned, I'll, 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 I think you got to wrap it up. It, it is um, General Powell has a, a, a clip where he gets asked, uh, what's the most important trait of leadership? And he goes on to answer that. It's a, it's a stunningly impactful video. It's an interview that he does and it's in three and a half minutes, everything you've ever wanted to know about leadership. But it, at, during a point in that, he talks about the fact that the leader can't, even when they're cold and tired and hungry, they can't act like they're cold, hungry and tired and hungry. And they, they've got to sometimes put on the brave face. And it's not to say that they aren't feeling those things, but there are times where they have to put on that, hey, look, it's going to still be OK, because if you allow your troops to say to think, oh, this sucks, this is the worst thing ever, they're going to feel that they internalize that and then they carry that message forward. And uh, that it, you just reminded me that that video clip, it talks specifically about that. And the context is in you know the military and he's in Vietnam as a small unit leader. It, again, get past that bridge translated to what it is for us in the fire service. And that kitchen table is, is really a, a central piece of that. Yeah. I'll have to look that up. Sounds, sounds like I'll send you a link. It's good. It's like, okay. to me, it's like, if you had five minutes to teach a leadership class, roll that. Clip. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mark kind of getting into the, just starting to wrap everything up. I'd like to just hear from, from your personal experience. What are some of the biggest things that you have learned since becoming, you know, in that, in that training environment in the training division and mm -hmm. all of that. And cause I know, and I, I had a Oklahoma city training officer on Justin Lorenzen uh, a few weeks ago. And these are just interesting things for me to hear because mm -hmm. they see so wide of a spectrum of people and crews and all that. So yeah. what, what are some lessons that you have learned being on that side? Well, uh, application of leadership in a small unit environment is, is I, I'm, I have to pick my words carefully. It's easy. It's not easy, but it's easy because in a sense, I've got to, I've got to influence, lead, supervise, manage, however you want to put it, five, six, eight people, depending on the environment that I'm in. In a training environment, in, 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 a, in an environment where you're trying to influence an entire organization, to build a systems-based approach. And I am, I am one of the, I am the founding member of what I call the double G fan club. That, that would be Gordon Graham, um, like one of his original groupies. And uh, he, he, he says it, it's about systems. It's always about systems. And unless you have a systems-based approach to train and educate your members, you're going to fail as an organization. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. And the problem the fire service has is we have, a, generally speaking, from one coast to the other, fairly effective systems in place to train our newest members. They exist. A pro B, well, I don't care if it's a volunteer agency with one, you know, fire company with one house or, uh, you know, 10,000 member fire department. We have those structures there in one way, shape or form. What they look like can be wildly divergent, but they're there. The issue in creating a systems-based approach for training fire officers is that it in large measure doesn't exist or it's such a small effort. And when you can, all you gotta do is look at the budget. It's that classic line, show me where you spend your money, you show me where your priorities are. Yeah. And when you look at how much money is invested on the front end it, and time and resources for any agency, it's a fair amount. 
then ask the question, how much are you dedicating to professional development, leadership development, officer development? It, it, it ranges anywhere between zero to 5%. That yeah. is catastrophic for us because the outcome of that on, in the firehouse and on the fire ground is so self-evident. And when we look at, all you gotta do is turn on the 11 o'clock news, look at the latest blog, the news bits on, you know, these failed leadership environments and it's, it's just functional leaders that are, you know, doing ridiculous things. Well, that's, that's what we have to get to. And so uh, to be in that environment, what, I, what I've come to understand so clearly, and I knew it a little bit from my time in basic training, but again, that's still a smaller group. That's a group of 20, 30, 40 recruits. To, to take that to an officer corps in our agency of 431. And remember, it's not about your existing leaders. It's about your existing and your future leaders. Because if you start training for leadership the day they get promoted, you're the only word I can apply to this, you're fucked. You, you, you are already behind the eight ball. You have to start training for leadership and followership during training week one. That's that's when you have that idea that I'm going to start training them to be leaders in my organization from the first day they arrive all the way forward. That's when success will happen. Sit down. Yeah. Sorry, I got kids. No, you're good. Hey, no, no worries at all. Hey, you can pop them in there if you want. <laughs> no, that's, that's good stuff. And like I said, I think those are important for us because I, I put out a little kind of a mindset episode here a couple of days ago about perspective mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it's so easy for us. And I feel like maybe this is more of a personal thing right now going on, but I feel like it's so easy to have a divide between uh, these on the line guys and these admin people, you know, if it's training or EMS or whatever it is. And it's so easy to happen because I don't know anything about your job. Mm -hmm. I know that I can very quickly say or very quickly feel like, man, these people are not supporting us. That's their job is to support us. And mm -hmm. all they want is more and more and more. Mm -hmm. And they don't really understand what we have already. It, it's very easy to fall into that trap. And yes. so that that's kind of the, the background of why I wanted to ask that question is because we need to, and it's empathy, you know, and that's another piece of that. Mm -hmm. And you kind of mentioned a little bit of this earlier about griping down and not understanding that what, what you are irritated about is really what you're doing to somebody else. It's having some empathy, understanding, okay, what I may perceive on the surface is probably not really the case because I don't really know what's going on. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's a very important piece of, of hopefully something that will get us to a better place at the, as the fire service in general. Yeah, that idea of just creating that civil war between day work and field, operations, admin, uh, it, it, it is so simple to fall in that trap because when you're on the line, you know, it, your perception is, is that, oh my God, more training and now we got to go back up and now they want me to do this. Don't they know I'm saving lives and making a difference? And, and what we forget is that this isn't like a Fortune 500 company where we hire a bunch of people off the street to come in and do these functions. <laughs> Everybody in our, every uniform ever started out on the line at some point. Yeah. And now, but to your point, what, what I think is important is not only you're, you're speaking for that empathy uh, for the line guy or gal to understand, hey, look, they got needs, but it comes the other way too, because there are times where when you're in, you know, Puzzle Palace, when you're at, uh, you know, in under fluorescent lights, that if you don't make that connection that what I'm, just because I think this is a good idea, what's the net impact? So that empathy has to go both ways, because if, if all we do is just throw, you know, requirement after requirement and don't build in the capacity, don't build in the time, don't build in the resources, that's not effective either. So it, it's a conversation that's important that goes both ways. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's kind of the road that we have to take if if we're truly going to make this thing better. You know, it's it's going to take everybody being involved in doing that. It's not just. It's not just admin, you know, uh, you can't just blame, well, these guys are making it hard on us because they're putting all that blah, blah, blah. It's not just, it's everybody. Everybody has got to do a better job. Everybody can do a better job. Yeah. So absolutely. Absolutely. 
Well, I have very much appreciate your time, Mark. I've, I've truly enjoyed the conversation. It's, I haven't, I've got some notes that I try to start with and we barely even touch them, but <laughs> that's, that's, that's the fun thing about this is, you know, it, it goes where it goes and yeah. and hopefully maybe we can come get you back and, and kind of touch on some different yeah, things. No, as well, a- so. Absolutely. Or, you know, if you're ever in this neck of the wood, we'll have a beer and we can hit all the rest of those up. Uh, I've, I've had uh, occasion to be in Oklahoma a couple of times. So now, now I'll definitely, uh, uh, give oh, yeah. y'all if I'm back out there again. Sounds good. So you got your Facebook group. Go ahead and just tell us a little bit about that, about that and, and any kind of contact information you want to put out there, how to, how people can find you. Yeah, uh, I've got a Facebook group. I, I, I don't put a, a lot into it. it it's, a, it's a public group, um, but I compartmentalize my life. So I've got my regular page where I'm not one of these guys that says, hey, look, I'm, you know, selfie. I'm getting a cup of coffee and selfie. <laughs> I'm, I'm going shopping. I, I, you know, every now and again, I'll put something on my personal page. I've got the one for the fire department. I got one going back to my time dressing like a tree. So the Mark Davidson officer development training, if, if you want to. And again, to me, that's a platform for an exchange of ideas. Uh, yeah. I've got people. I'm not one of these people like only I post on there. As long as you got something positive, something that's an idea. So we have all these different fire service leaders that are posting material on there. We had one the other day uh, from a chief down in Texas talking about, hey, officer development programs. It was awesome because the next thing you know, there's like 15 posts from different people on ideas for officer development. Yeah. And, hey, we tried this and, and connect, you know, made connections. And so that that's the idea for that. Just, you know, about leadership in the fire service and the fire yeah. service uh, uh, more broadly. And um, so, yeah, you know, hit, hit me up on there, um, you know, to, uh, you know, do some of the shows and try and talk and get the word out wherever I can. And, you know, if uh, anybody wants to reach out on messenger, um, you know, hit me up and, and we can chat it up. So. Sounds good. Had a good time. Look forward to getting into some more conversation later for sure. I enjoyed Absolutely. it. I really appreciate it. Uh, like I said, love talk, getting an opportunity to talk about this stuff. So thanks a lot. And thanks for what you're doing. No problem. All right, everybody, thank you for joining us. Look forward to having you back next time. Until then, everybody stay safe and take care of each other. Thank you. Take care.